uh, he is a unique figure in the early modern history of india he changed the political architecture of india he changed the political map of india he took on the mughal empire when the mughal empire covered one fifth of the world's explored surface shivaji had a total of 700 naval vessels and more than 50 of these were meant for defense specifically meant for defense but over 600 were were actually trading vessels and he had started trading with the foreign countries in the british factory records we have the british complaining and i've mentioned it in the book that a lot of their expert marine engineers are going over to shivaji's side simply because he's paying them very handsome wages and he's paying them much more than they would pay him hello a very good evening A very good evening. Welcome to Swaraj Conversations. I'm really privileged to be joined by Mr. Vaibhav Purandare who is a very proud author of Shivaji India's greatest warrior king and uh, this is his latest book among the other books that he's written. He's a senior editor at the Times of India. Vaibhav ji, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, a very good evening to you sir. Thank you Sharan for inviting me to this interview. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, first of all, Shivaji is a very popular uh, figure, especially because of the political relevance uh, that the uh, that that the great man has even today. But uh, beyond that, I've seen you say that you know Shivaji is actually not written about a lot when it comes to history or any of his achievements. Uh, why would you say that, or would you say that? is not been written about enough in the english language uh, particularly maybe because in, in marathi i'm sure he is much more represented sharan i you're right that uh, when i say that shivaji has not been adequately represented in indian history writing i am talking about our mainstream history books or i am talking about our textbooks whether they are at a school level or the university level and i am talking about mainstream academia Uh, which has uh, disregarded him a great deal and focused perhaps disproportionately on other figures of the era uh, especially the mughals now i am not for a moment saying the mughals are not important but uh, they got disproportionate space in comparison with shivaji and other national heroes of india and it's time that uh, a corrective is put in place so that chatrapati shivaji gets his due Uh, he is a unique figure in the early modern history of india he changed the political architecture of india he changed the political map of india he took on the mughal empire when the mughal empire covered one fifth of the world's explored surface until then you know so it was a gigantic empire and here is one man from one corner of the deccan of the western parts of india who challenges the might of such a gigantic empire and shivaji's david takes on aurangzeb's goliath goliath and and creates right. the found, foundations for the eventual downfall of the mughal empire and also creates the foundations of the maratha polity which then after shivaji's death expands across india and controls pretty much almost as much as as much of the territory that the mughal empire at one point in time used to cover so Many for a man kings, who has for a man yeah. who for a man who so radically and fundamentally transformed the history of the subcontinent he hasn't got adequate attention many of the kings who were present at that point of history they had to balance a lot even in terms of diplomacy because um, kinetic warfare doesn't always help you to meet your goal sometimes you do have to accept that you are outpowered or overpowered by certain other force in india in that sense shivaji was perhaps one of the very few people or the only person in in bharat at that point of time who was very assertive in his identity assertive in his conquests that he used to do uh, is it just because of military power that he developed later on or does it have to do some uh, something uniquely about the person that he was I think it has a lot to do with uh, his personality his uh, resolve his character and his resilience and will power because if he didn't have all of these things there's no way he could have challenged such a big empire if you look at it in purely numerical terms 
his army or navy are simply not comparable to that of the mughals you know because uh, the mughals have literally lakhs of soldiers by their side willing to fight along you know with their troops and they can also summon people from across india you know people who are their stooges or vassals and all these people and shivaji starts out with a very small band of 5000 10000 people from the western deccan and then emerges as this big hero in the history of india that is because he is far sighted enough to realize that he should not be batting you know fighting pitched battles so you have a say an army of 100000 and if shivaji's 10000 soldiers take them head on then there's going to be a massacre so instead what he realizes is that he has to be extremely strategic in the way he goes about doing things and he uses his intelligence his political acumen and sagacity and intelligence to get things done so he he knows his strength is in the hills in the mountains and he makes the fullest use of the mountainous territory that he belongs to to take on his enemies and to gradually build and expand his his state his the independent state that he's building so what is remarkable about shivaji is the high amount of intelligence that he displays and the smartness he shows in dealing with the enemy and uh, he is not one of those right. warriors who will just head into the battlefield and sacrifice himself you know he he uses his brain he says okay let i am not going to do that because then i am going to be a goat that's going to be sacrificed no i will survive i will fight and i will destroy the enemy and that's how he systematically builds the state so in in a sense he also uh, he is quite innovative in the way he goes about strategizing uh, with the help of his close associates comrades right. and overall army um, any civilization is actually built uh, on its sea power essentially because even today 90% of the trade that happens happens through maritime routes and india did have that kind of naval power and a naval fleet and you write about this in the book and you say that perhaps with the decline of the cholas even india's naval power sort of declined Yeah. And I think the story is very similar to China as well. In, at one point, they did have a decent amount of naval power, and once that started reducing, the British came in and uh, came in and they took over. So, uh, how did we lose that gap? And secondly, what made Shivaji realize the the need for a maritime power or a navy power to actually take on these? Because at a point when you had to face the Mughals, you Aurangzeb yeah. was perhaps your uh, biggest uh, enemy. and then you had to take on the british the focus was more inwards so yeah. where was a scope for looking outwards when it came to shivaji yeah i think that's where his vision really comes in his political vision really comes in and it's remarkable that he has this innate awareness that sea power is important in terms of defense as well as in terms of trade and you are absolutely right in saying that uh, india witnessed a decline of its sea power after the disappearance of the chola empire and for 5 and or 6 centuries nobody really thought of uh, you know controlling the sea sea front and whether it was the mughals or the deccan sultanates they all completely ignored this aspect of security uh, a very critical aspect of security especially in a, in, a, in an era when you had no airplanes you know and uh, the land and the seas were where were only the two areas where you could fight and like you correctly said sea power is still extremely important very very critical so shivaji starts building his navy and he demonstrates this vision that sea power is important and it's important if you want to look after your own state's security and it's important if you want to promote and push trade so he not only started building defense vessels all kinds of vessels you know whether it was big middle sized or small for the sake of defending the coastline but he also started at the same time building his trade vessels and he by the time he was coronated uh, at the age of 44 in the in the year 1674 shivaji had a total of 
700 naval vessels and more than 50 of these were meant for defense specifically meant for defense but over 600 right. were, were actually trading vessels and he had started trading with the foreign countries uh, what happened was that very early in his career shivaji noticed that even if the bijapur sultan had to go overseas or go to mecca and madina to the yeah. holy shrines of islam they needed licenses or permits or approvals from the foreign powers that were then controlling the coastline. The British were there, the Portuguese were there, the French were there, the Dutch were there and they had completely taken over India's coastline and the Mughals simply did not have the vision or the ability to understand that the coastline was extremely important, especially in a uh, subcontinent like ours where the size of the coastline is mammoth really. And Shivaji understood this that even if he wanted to get weapons from, from abroad, guns from abroad or good technology from abroad, he needed to control the waters. And if he wanted to do trade with uh, other places, he needed to control the waters. So, so both these aspects he kept in mind. He realized that unnecessarily things had been handed out to the foreigners and we needed to take control of it. And he started taking control of things. Right. And how do you think this has impacted uh, India's naval power in the future, whether it's today in the 21st century when you see a sense of decolonization, when the new Navy ensign is being replaced, yeah. or much more earlier when Sindhya started uh, shipping companies. Uh, so yeah. do you think Shivaji as an example actually influenced or is it looking into too much? No, I, I think we can certainly say that uh, Shivaji uh, influenced uh, the building of India's national fleet definitely because it was the precedent that he set, the pioneering work that he did that built the foundations for all the future work that happened. Because uh, as we know, after Shivaji's death, uh, Kanhoji Angre and others built the Maratha naval fleet even further and made it much more stronger. And after a gap of so many centuries, Shivaji took up this important work of building a naval fleet and that is when India and Indians really got a foothold on the coastline. So this foothold was extremely important to, to building the foundations of a naval fleet and I think Shivaji is a pioneer in that regard. Certainly the role of the Cholas cannot be underplayed, cannot be undermined. But we must remember that Shivaji was, as you correctly said, fighting the Mughals at the same time, fighting the British on the coastline at the same time, the Portuguese, the Dutch, the French, Bijapur, Adil Shahi, Qutub Shahi and so many forces. And yet he displays this enormous awareness of the significance of the coastline. I think that's where he becomes a real pioneer. Uh, you also mentioned in one of the interview that he got many people, uh, especially marine engineers who worked with yeah. the Portuguese and the British to work with him. How was that actually possible considering that, you know, it's not a very easy task to do? See, Shivaji is an expert negotiator. All his life, if you examine his life, you see that he is constantly negotiating even with his enemies because he understands the importance of negotiating, of communication, of keeping channels of communication open. So, and he does that even with Aurangzeb, even with Bijapur, even with Qutub Shahi and similarly with the foreign powers. But here, in this re regard, there is a significant difference also there. In the sense that while he is negotiating and corresponding with the British and the Portuguese, he does not take help directly from the British powers. He employs individual marine engineers who are British and he pays them much more money than right. the British are, Britishers are paying him. And in fact, in the British factory records, we have the British complaining and I have mentioned it in the book that a lot of their expert marine engineers are going over to Shivaji's side simply because he's paying them very handsome wages and he's paying them right. much more than they would pay him. So he understood that, you know, he needed to pay well. He, uh, the Marathas needed uh, modern naval technology. The Marathas didn't have that technology. As a matter of fact, uh, no Indian power had that technology. So he very cleverly borrowed that technology and got foreign experts to build stuff. And at the same time, while they were building stuff, he also got the local people to understand the building of that naval fleet so that they would then go on to build their own indigenous fleet in the future. 
Similarly, he engages Portuguese experts. And the Portuguese are also wondering what our people are doing there. And in fact, uh, the Mughals complained to the Portuguese saying that your people are building ships for Shivaji. What are you up to? So again, they are forced to say that, no, we have nothing to do with it. He's taken away individuals from us. He's paying them. He's treating them well. So Shivaji has that cleverness uh, and uh, an, ex an extremely good ability to, to get right. people over to his side and to work in the national interest and in his state's interest in such a way that the state progresses. And he's not hesitant to borrow technology from overseas, from other countries, if the need be. In fact, Shivaji's first naval expedition was uh, to Karnataka uh, in a place called Basrur. Correct. And uh, one of my senior colleagues, uh, Harsha, actually wrote about this in Swarajya. Uh, usually, because of the politicization of historical figures, even yeah. Shivaji was seen with a bit of, uh, how do I say, <clears throat> uh, uh, a bit of opposition by several parties in Karnataka. But at the end of the day, he came in with a good intent and the people there in that town uh, particularly celebrate uh, that victory even today because he liberated them. Yeah, the Basrur expedition that you mentioned, uh, I have dealt with it in my book uh, that uh, Shivaji actually was uh, believed to you know, uh, be going towards Goa by the Portuguese and the others also. So the Portuguese were getting ready for his advances and they thought that he might attack them from the sea. But he actually took the sea waters and he quietly bypassed Goa and, and landed at Basrur, you know, uh, and, and in Karnataka. Uh, so, uh, so in a way, he was able to actually overpower the Portuguese themselves. Correct, absolutely. Uh, and and he, he took them completely by surprise because they thought he was coming for them. And he goes further down south and goes to Basrur. And... The point about liberation that you mentioned is also important because Shivaji was indeed a liberator. He took on the established systems and he revamped revenue administration systems. He gave people a sense of freedom, of cultural freedom, of religious freedom at a time when the Mughals and um, Aurangzeb were getting increasingly uh, fanatical uh, and intolerant. And the Portuguese were also up to a lot of uh, uh, mischief in Goa. Uh, yeah. uh, very significantly, Shivaji rebuilds uh, and refurbishes a, a temple in Goa, uh, which has been demolished right. by the foreign rulers there, by the Portuguese rulers there. So he is assertive yeah. about his cultural identity. Uh, he is highly tolerant and uh, welcoming of outside influences. He respects uh, Islam, Christianity and other religions and treats their people uh, with as much respect as he would respect as he would treat anybody else but at the same time he makes it very clear that he will not allow his cultural and civilizational identity to be diminished or wiped right. out in any way and any su yeah. any such attempt to wipe out that uh, identity is met with tremendous resistance by him in fact a few of his naval commanders also happen to be muslim and this is particularly surprising because, you know, uh, those were the times when religious identities were at, were at its uh, strongest binaries, perhaps, especially because of years of Mughal rule. And there was uh, an asserting Hindu identity, if you may say so, because uh, we were challenging the British as well. So at that point in time, it was very special because I, I don't think this characteristic was actually exhibited by any other person. So do you think, you know, there is a misrepresentation of uh, Shivaji Maharaj today uh, by saying that, of, of course, he asserted his cultural Hindu identity. Yeah. But, uh, you know, that gets overshadowed with the fact that he was actually pluralistic in, its, in uh, his nature and in his administration. Yeah, absolutely. You need to sh look at Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj as a whole uh, because, you know, he built what I can call a Hindu polity. A Hindu polity that is uh, underpinned by values of tolerance and inclusiveness. And as far as the moral compass is concerned, you know, he's far ahead of his times. Because uh, in spite of all the religious and cultural conflict that's happening, he does not discriminate between people on the basis of religion. He, he appoints people in his army, in his navy, on the basis of merit, which is why, like you said, 
two of his navy ad- admirals are muslims daulat khan and darya sarang went ji you know that that's remarkable at a time when the the mughals and bijapur had made it very clear that you know hindus could not rise above a certain position in the mughal army or in the bijapur hierarchy but shivaji did not have such limits for anything or anybody you know he he de- he was a, a right. meritocrat and his moral compass was very wide uh, in the sense that he did not tolerate any kind of injustice or oppression uh, of you know right. injustice against and oppression of women children and holy books of all faiths including the quran the bible and all of that so there are examples of uh, which i have cited cited in the book where his enemies concede uh, his mughal enemies who call him all sorts of names concede that shivaji had given express uh, instructions to his people that if they found a copy of the holy quran he would they his soldiers had to return it to its rightful owner with the complete respect that it deserved right. if they captured women and children they have to ensure that the women and children are returned to their families and homes uh, in complete safety and security so this is where he he really uh, demonstrates his moral compass which is which is much ahead of uh, the 17th century really uh, earlier we were also talking about um, how his personality basically drove a lot of the expeditions and the ambitions that he later on had in life and yeah. it's particularly uh, surprising um, because you talk about the relationship that he had with uh, both his mother and his uh, father and yeah. his father at one point in time did not even oppose his uh, ambitions to de- defeat the bijapur uh, kingdom you know while he was working for the kingdom and he was even enslaved by the same people later on why do you think that happened well uh, what i found in my research you know on the subject is that uh, shivaji had a very close bond with both his parents his mother had a tremendous influence on him uh, because you know she had inherited the bhakti point sets tradition and she told him stories from india's great epics and uh, because of which you know he imbibed uh, the values uh, that he did and as far as his father was concerned he took from shahaji raje bhosle his father uh, you know his his military Uh, ability uh, the confidence that to be a military leader of note he saw his valor he saw how uh, his father had uh, uh, single handedly propped up the nizam shahi state during its very last years in the early 1630s when shivaji was very small very young and then he also looks at how his father is managing his jagir of bangalore uh, which the uh, adil shah has given him and uh, the bond is so great that uh, uh, shiva uh, you know shahaji is is very cleverly uh, zigzagging his way uh, through this whole quagmire in the sense that he is serving bijapur on the one hand and on the one hand he is not opposing what his son is doing so he is tacitly backing him we cannot say he is openly backing him but he is he is he is he is very passively and quietly yeah. uh, quietly approving of what the son is doing uh, so uh, i think shivaji takes inspiration from both his father and his mother uh, but of course the mother's the mother gave him spine and spirituality uh, and i think i think those two things really stood him in in good stead and really uh, helped him to to take on some very very formidable enemies you know uh, i in fact uh, Uh, many most people in this place wouldn't have even thought thought of taking uh, taking on an empire like uh, as big as that of the mughals and uh, people usually say that he is the perfect antidote to somebody like aurangzeb because aurangzeb was perhaps at his most powerful um, when shivaji was on the rise uh, so how do you um, in your perspective say that you know uh, how do you think the indian history changed at that particular point in time because of uh, shivaji's arrival on the scene indian history has changed uh, fundamentally and radically because of shivaji's uh, arrival and his assertiveness because had he not arrived on the scene and had he not asserted himself then aurangzeb would have walked all over the subcontinent because the deccan was the frontier for him and uh, 
that was a frontier he desperately and badly wanted to cross and he wanted to badly dominate the deccan and uh, shivaji simply didn't allow him to do that in his lifetime and in fact shivaji's uh, after life is also important in this regard because shivaji's power the power that shivaji built the state that he built turned out to be so enduring that his successors put up a really valiant fight against aurangzeb after shivaji's death aurangzeb comes down to the deccan in 1681 82 to fulfill his dream of capturing and dominating the deccan but shivaji's successors put up such a big fight and uh, such a valiant fight that shivaji that uh, aurangzeb actually get stuck in the deccan because the war is an unending one he simply cannot conquer them the way he thinks he can and for more than two decades for 25 years in fact he gets stuck there and he dies there in the deccan without having captured it and controlled it so uh, it's a measure of uh, the the importance of what shivaji did that aurangzeb finally dies in in the soil of the deccan and is buried in the soil of the deccan while maratha par continues to grow and then right. gets into northern india as well and goes all the way up to uh, attack in uh, which is today in pakistan and all the way to bengal in the east so the fight against aurangzeb uh, is is a mammoth and gigantic one started by shivaji it's a momentous clash between aurangzeb and shivaji an intolerant and fanatical and extremely powerful man on the one hand and uh, a man with very limited resources uh and uh, limited technology on the other but tremendous resilience resolve and will power and vision on the other hand and the man with will power and resolu- uh, resolution and resilience actually wins wins the day so it is truly a david versus goliath kind of story that uh, shivaji has of his own and that's why it's important if aurangzeb had really taken over the deccan uh because of his fanaticism the entire political map would have changed the cultural map would have changed the religious map of india would have changed even further than it had already done and i think uh, shivaji is responsible for the cultural and civilizational revival of india uh, right. in the 17th century and i think that is why you know he is he is so enormously important in indian history Vaibhav ji thank you so much for giving us your time uh, it's been very lovely talking to you but before we sign off uh, could you tell our viewers where they can buy your book uh, etc so that it becomes easier and we'll also put a link to your amazon uh, in the description below of our video yes of course sharan uh, uh, my book is available in all leading bookstores across india and if you prefer to buy stuff online then of course it's on amazon it's on flipkart it's on all the possible websites from which you buy your books and uh, uh, it's also available for purchase on the jagannath website uh, jagannath books okay. is is my publisher it's available on their website as well you can order it there as well you can order it pretty much from everywhere so uh, do do make sure you get your copy and uh, sharan thank you so much for this very nice interview and for inviting me to this interview thanks thank you so much for joining me vaibhav ji i hope we can have a conversation once again in the future definitely sharan i'll i'd be delighted to viewers please do let us know what you thought about this conversation and if you have any questions uh, for vaibhav ji do let us know in the comment section below and i'm sure he'll be happy to address uh, any of them definitely i will address those questions thank you